it's time for school days. Help for moms and dads of school-age kids. I tell parents, you're like a training wheel on a bike. Your job isn't to make the bike move. Your job is to keep the bike upright. Those of us who are the true educators, we really want to be given the opportunity to educate the whole child. Sometimes we make decisions with our kids on how we think our kids are going to feel in the first 10 minutes versus thinking about 10 months or 10 years. Oftentimes, as parents, I think we want to protect our kids. But I think one of the greatest gifts we can give them is allowing them to experience that first. Yeah. You're your host. David and Danita Bailey. Good evening and welcome to School Days, Help for Moms and Dads of School Age Kids. I'm Danita Bailey. And I'm David Bailey. An estimated 6.1 million children have been diagnosed with ADHD at some point in their lives. Symptoms of ADHD can affect a student's behavior and academic performance at school. It can be misunderstood by both those who struggle with the disorder and by those around them. But with support and strategies, students can learn to thrive. So you missed an episode that we did a few years ago about ADHD because you were on a field trip with one of our sons. That was a real big bummer, but you have ADHD. I do. Yes, you. <laughs> yes, you. Yeah. Um, I that was took, why it was a bummer that you were gone, yeah. not because you were on the field trip. Oh uh, Yeah. You know, so I, I took uh, John, our middle child on a field trip um, and that was the day. I mean, I called in though. I think I you called. Did. I you did and call John in. both called in. Yeah, we called in just to holler at you guys. Um, but um, yeah, back in 2018, I was diagnosed with AD, ADD, and um, my wife had been telling me for years, <laughs> you know, I think you have ADD, and I was like, but I have a master's degree. Like that was my logic for not thinking I had ADD. And uh, yeah, so I started looking up all the very successful people who had ADD to show you that you can also be successful and have ADD. Yeah. And, and so as I did, did more research on it and oh, OK, well, hey, the, was Justin Timberlake's on there and Richard Branson's on there and many other people um, are, are successful, have ADD. Um, but, you know, then you know, I, I, you know, take prescribed medicine, which is help. But then I also realized without strategies that I also learned I can focus on my bad habits better. <laughs> and so I just got really good at getting better at the bad stuff. Um, so, okay, so that's not enough. It's good, it helped, but then I started digging and diving and researching and reading about you know just ways to you know get better at life, um, which has helped me become a better educator, which has helped uh, me to get more organized in my personal life and for our family. Um, and you know, what we're talking about today is with our students is how to help them to be, you know, just to be better and stronger. And honestly, uh, parents, whether your child has ADD or not, um, most of the strategies, if not all the strategies today we're going to be talking about um, are going to be beneficial to all students mm. and, and particularly students with ADD. Uh, but this is just going to be some good stuff today. I'm, I'm loaded. I'm excited and uh, ready to uh, go in deep with our guest today. One of the things I'm really excited about is, you know, as somebody that does not have an ADHD or brain, ADHD brain, if you want to say it that way, sure I want to, <laughs> I want to better understand someone who does have that. And I think that that's something that's really going to be helpful for parents. Our marriage. <laughs> Yeah, that's what she's trying to say. I'm, I'm kind of reading between the lines. I'm interpreting, you know, because you just don't understand my mind and how it works. And she's like, no, I don't. How can you, why did you do that? Anyway, I'm just saying, I keep going, babe. Yeah, it'll be very helpful for parents and our marriage. So, hey, <laughs> win, win. Yes, yes. But uh, the, the episode that we did a few years ago that I mentioned a little bit earlier had was an extensive overview of ADHD that included diagnosis and different types of treatment and medications and therapies. So that'll also be helpful if your student is struggling with the symptoms of ADHD. And you can go to our website, schooldaysshow.com and click on the show archive tab and scroll down to the learning disabilities and you'll find the episode there. But our guest today is going to be, um, is an academic and ADHD coach, and she'll talk to us about specific strategies that she recommends when coaching her students with ADHD. 
But before we go any further, let me just say it does take a village. If you hear a great parenting tip or a nugget of advice, share it with your parent friends. Facebook it, Instagram it, tweet it, link it in, and add the hashtag School Dazed Show or hashtag I Am School Dazed. And we also want you to be a part of the show. So if you're listening to us live on Facebook right now, you can give us a call at 214-444-5575 and ask our guests a question or two. So let's go ahead and welcome our guest. Our kid caster this week is almost fifth grader because he'll be a fifth grade in the fall. Wyatt Stillwell from Texas. Dr. Noreen Russell began Russell coaching in 2009. Her passion for providing support to frustrated students and real appearances fueled by her our experience of raising two complex children who are both neurologically atypical. With 20 years of experience creating positive youth development and parenting education programs, Dr. Russell has an extensive knowledge of child development, learning styles, special needs, and positive parenting philosophies. Dr. Russell has a PhD from Bowling Green State University with a focus on psychology and education. She consults with and trains at both public and private schools across the Tampa Bay area and has taught psychology and education course at a number of colleges. Dr. Russell is dedicated to walking beside families and helping them turn chaos into calm. Welcome to School Day, Dr. Russell. Well, welcome, Dr. Russell. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. But first of all, I have to say that that is the most memorable, touching, sweetest introduction that I have ever received in my life. I want to meet this this kid. I want I want to know him. I want to thank him for being so incredibly thoughtful with his words as he introduced me. That That's really heartwarming. You, oh. I love this show already. Oh, that gave me chills. I will for sure let Wyatt know. Wyatt uh, and his family go to our church, and so he'll be real excited to hear that. <laughs> but thank you so much for being here. We are really excited. As David said, he is, what did you say, locked and loaded or something? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's loaded. So we're going to jump right in. So can you first just tell us, what is ADHD? Sure, absolutely. Um, so ADHD is a neurodevelopmental disorder that is diagnosed by looking for three symptoms. And the first is an inability to regulate attention. So this is sort of the first place where I think a lot of people start to develop misunderstandings about ADHD. People think that kids or adults, David, without, um, with who have ADHD can't focus. That's not the case at all. Mm. What is problematic for them is that their brain doesn't automatically regulate their attention. So of course they have the capacity to pay attention. What they don't have is the neurological wiring for their brain to naturally regulate attention. And then the second characteristic of ADHD that I think most of us will recognize is impulsivity and which is we would call that knowing better but being unable to do better which is different from knowing better but not caring right or not really knowing that that thing was wrong so impulsivity is really you know better and you can't do better and then the third piece that most people have but not everyone you can have adhd with or without hyperactivity is that physical or verbal hyperactivity. And I think that's what a lot of people have a stereotype about or a picture in their mind of the kid who acts as if driven like a motor, um, just does not stop talking, running, walking, moving, fidgeting. Um, I myself don't diagnose ADHD, but those are the three characteristics and symptoms that those 
psychologists and medical professionals who do diagnose use. I want to say that I think it's really important for us to understand that ADHD is primarily a neurological problem with self-regulation. And I'm looking forward to the day when there's a whole different uh, language around what we currently call ADHD, because I think that we have gone down a little bit of a rabbit hole with the focus on they can't pay attention um, and really lost sight of the neurology of the inability to regulate attention. So, you know, you said something that was so, I think, helpful. I, I, as a parent, you know, you, I have two neuro atypical children, one with autism, one with ADHD. And um, as far as my, my son with autism, it has been very, once he was diagnosed, it was very helpful to um, know that there was a source of the things that we were seeing, some of the um, eccentricities we were seeing and um, annoyances, they were annoyances at the time. And now we see them a lot differently. And so you said um, they know better, but can't do better. So I think that that is very powerful for parents to understand that they're not just bad kids. Cause I think ADHD kids sometimes, um, get labeled that way. They really do. They really do. And to me, that is profoundly sad. I think in my heart, what I really am most of all is a child advocate and I'm an advocate for their well being, for their family connectedness, for their education. And quite honestly, I think even with everything that we know about the brain and brain research and psychology, kids with ADHD get the short end of the stick. It's mm -hmm. not quite as bad in elementary, but for sure, once we hit middle school and high school, I think there is all kinds of really unhelpful characterization of that behavior and this general sense of, well, she focused yesterday, she can focus today, or well, if he was motivated or if he wasn't so lazy. And, you know, that's just a real misunderstanding of how our brains work, whether they're typical or not. And it's a real misunderstanding of ADHD. Can you talk about the inconsistency there? Why is it that there's an inconsistency that you said that, well, she could focus today, but why can't she focus this next day? Right. I think this is one of the most aggravating parts about ADHD. And I think it's one of the reasons why many adults, whether we're parents, professionals, or teachers think if this kid just tried harder, right? Because one day they'll knock it out of the ballpark. They'll sit there, they'll write the five paragraph essay. They'll use all the great vocabulary. They'll remember the punctuation. And then the next day, the performance is uneven and they're not able to complete the spelling test or do the standardized testing. And this, when I talk with parents, I stress, this is a normal part of ADHD, this inconsistency in performance. That's the lack of self-regulation, right? It's not that the child is incapable of doing these things. It's that there is performance variability. It's a problem at the point of performance. And what affects children and adults, and, and David may have something to say about this for, for his experience of ADHD is, you know, when kids are tired, when they're stressed, when they're hungry, when they are super distracted, when they don't feel connected at school, all of those things decrease the capacity for executive functioning. Now, I also, like you, Donita, don't have ADHD. But I know for me, when I'm tired, I have a hard time focusing, right? My brain kind of chips in a little bit better than the ADHD brain and helps me along. But if I'm tired or hungry or angry, um, I have a hard time focusing. And for people with ADHD, it's like that, but significantly more impairment from the variability. So instead of saying he did it yesterday, he should be able to do it today. I think we need to start asking, what was it yesterday that made him able to be successful? And how can we create that in the classroom or at home as often as possible? I know for my two, a huge part of 
what they need in order to be in touch with their self-regulation and have their brains working to their advantage is sleep. And we are tyrants about sleep at my house. My kids are on a strict bedtime schedule. We don't let them stay up. We are the least fun parents in the world when it comes to staying up late because that for us is when we start to really see market impairments in their self-regulation. So do you, you know, when you were saying this, it made me think about an athlete and, you know, when you have an athlete, that's a professional athlete and they, you know, if they're tired or they ate a bunch of junk or drank too much alcohol the night before or something like that, they're not going to perform as good as they are. They're not going to perform the way that they should be performing. So maybe, so it sounds like that's what you're saying is the same thing for the ADHD brain. Interesting. Right. Absolutely. And their coaches don't let them do those things. Right. Um, I know (laughs) even though we've established, I'm not much of a sports person. I think the high school coaches here don't let their kids go out, say on Friday night before a big football game, or, you know, they do have a certain curfew or they're encouraged to, you know, eat in a certain healthy way. And so their coaches help them train how to get in the best shape possible. And that's what we can do as parents and educators and academic and ADHD coaches too, is help that student think about how and when and why does your brain work well? How do we get you in that place so that you can work your brain in the best way possible? And that is super exciting to me when a student is like, oh, right, this is what I need. I don't know about you, but we can be done with the episode right now. (laughs) That, that was that was so helpful for you for oh okay you need more than that yes yes <laughs> no, i need yeah. for me that was incredible yes <laughs> um i've been trying to i've been trying to tell her for years she just doesn't get me but that's but I'm, I'm glad you got it from somebody you know you gotta, <laughs> she's you know, an yeah, expert right <laughs> so but i will say this is um i think some of the challenges are and you can elaborate on this but there are societal and behavioral norms that are expected to be imposed upon all people to look the same way at all times. Mm -hmm. And so if there's a particular model of this is how you're supposed to behave, this is how you're supposed to sit, this is how you're supposed to pay attention, this is how you're supposed to A, B, C, D, and E. But when there's a student or a group of students that don't fit that model, Mm -hmm. instead of adjusting to fit their needs, we expect them to conform to our expectations. Um, and in teaching, we call this you know, dif- differentiated instruction. You know, one of the things that my principal, my first principal always said at the end of every email was, if a student doesn't learn in the way that you teach them, you teach them in the way that they learn. But what I see a lot of is, if you don't basically, if you don't sit down and shut up in class, then there's something wrong with you versus Maybe I need to change up how I teach to adjust to meet their needs. And so, um, because if if you think of the typical classroom setting, you think of rows and desks, sit down, sit up. And it hasn't changed. It really has not. The model has not really changed in (laughs) over 50, 100 plus years. You know, you can, I remember watching Little House on the Prairie back in the day, you know, (laughs) on the show and it was just, it's the same thing, but we're competing against the internet. We're competing against cell phones. We're competing against technology. We're competing against all these fun, flashy things. Then we expect the child just to sit down and and listen to a, a, a dry as saltine crackers lecture sometimes. Um, and then we say, well, what's wrong with you? <laughs> you know, when the challenge may be, well, what's wrong with maybe how can I enhance how I teach? And, you know, I was sharing before the show f- for parents is that, when I got diagnosed, I realized I need to change because I realized, well, I'm good, you know, and I'm teaching, but it's because I was getting my outlet. I was getting my energy out through my, I'm a very, as you can see if on the show, just imagine how I'm in the classroom with a bunch of middle schoolers. I'm very, very high energy. Um, he keeps hitting the mic. Yes, but <laughs> yeah, she hates that. Um, but I realized, you know, I need to change up my environment to make my room more conducive to students who don't like to sit in desk. Every child doesn't like to sit in a desk and that's okay. You know, as long as they don't disrupt learning, that's one issue. 
but you know, I started putting in gaming chairs in my room. They could sit low on the ground and rock. I have kids, they'll sit on the floor and they'll rock back and forth and they love it, but they're still working. I have kids lay on the floor. I don't care. I have a standing desk. You can adjust it, sit it up, sit it down. And it freed me. And when it freed me, it freed my kids. And um, what I saw were kids who were previously um, struggling now are beginning to not struggle as much because they had an outlet because I adjusted. And I think just I want to encourage those parents to say that um, maybe we need to be a little more flexible in how we um, approach our daily lives because maybe we're used to it. My wife, look, my wife can sit. <laughs> well, <laughs> I love my wife. She could sit at a desk from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. and she'll forget to eat lunch, y'all. Like, literally forget to eat lunch. I, after 10 minutes, I'm dying. I'm like, <sighs> you know, and, but there's nothing wrong with that. It, it's, I have to, I had to adjust how I work in my operating environment. Now, things that I enjoy, um, I can focus on a long time. So my whole point is that, is that with all of this, is that there are, um, we're, we're battling against societal norms, behavioral norms, and the the mind of someone who has ADD, ADHD, and how do we reconcile those two? I'm so excited to hear you be the one to bring it up because it's one of, I think, the most important pain points for us to talk about with parents is I'm on, as you might be as well, lots and lots of different um, groups on Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn and, and everything. And one of the questions that I see come up over and over again from parents is, how can I get my five-year-old to stop running around like a maniac, right? <laughs> how can I get my eight-year-old to remember to put on his shoes? How can I get my 12-year-old to make sure that he brushes his teeth and put his deodorant on? And there's this norm, I think, right, of how can I get my child to change? And the real question, quite honestly, and I'm going to speak frankly here is, how can I get rid of ADHD? Mm. Right? Like, mm. we don't say, for example, if your child has allergies, how can I get my child to stop sneezing? Mm. How can I get my child to not be so congested? Right? We don't say that. We say, oh, it's allergy season. Or we say, we need to start the, you know, the nasal spray, right? Or we need to go see the allergist, or we've been thinking about, you know, allergy shots for a few years. Maybe that would make a difference, but we don't say, how can I get my child to stop sneezing? And the same thing is true if you think about glasses, right? We don't say, how can I get my child to see better? How can mm -hmm. I get my child to look harder? How can I get my child to squint more effectively, right? Wow. Say, what are the glasses that are needed? And it's so fascinating to me because the conversation is really around how can I change my child and not how can I be an advocate for what my child needs, starting with myself, right? So I'll, I'll never forget having a conversation. I frequently recommend to parents that they get sheet protectors and they print out, you know, visual lists and they put them around the house. You know, if you've got a landing point for everything, put up a sheet protector that says, this is Ethan's landing point, you know, visually remind the child and then put the list of what should go here. The cell phone, the keys, the backpack, the lunchbox, right? On the way out the door, have the sheet protector. When, when my kids were a little younger and, and they probably need these now again as they're entering puberty and seem to have um, lost some of their executive functioning skills to the hormones of puberty, mm -hmm. um, we used to have the same list up in every bathroom of what do you do? You know, They both had multiple sheet protectors posted in their bedrooms. And I'll never forget, you know, most parents would say, oh, that's a great idea. And I would hand them 10 sheet protectors and I'd say, try it this week. And one parent looked at me and said, well, how am I going to hang those up in my house? And I thought, now, see, that is fascinating to me because your child is struggling, right? You're upset. You're yelling and screaming and looking for help. The child is upset because they're getting yelled and screamed at. 
And your question to me is, how am I going to hang those up in my house? My answer as a parent, and again, I'm super practical. My mom was the most practical person you'll ever meet in your life. I'd be like, well, with whatever tape you have handy would be my answer. <laughs> Gum. <laughs> So I have so many things here. Okay, you you said something that caught my ear. Does executive function really is it is it impacted by hormonal changes? Is that a thing? Well, okay, so this is sort of fascinating, right? As kids enter puberty, their brains change. You guys know this, right? You have you have sure not just the younger ones, right? You have uh-huh. okay. Yes, yeah. Well, we have one that's 13. Okay. Perfect. I have one who's 13 also. So um, as the brain starts to change in the time of puberty, there are chemical changes that happen, right? And we know that adolescents become more likely, for example, to take risks when they're in the company of their peers. We know that the feelings part of the brain becomes intensified. And so it is a gross oversimplification to say the frontal lobe kind of takes a little nap while the emotional parts of the brain ramp up. But sometimes if I'm talking with parents, I use that as a general structure. Now, obviously the frontal lobe doesn't go to sleep for five years, but what does happen in the adolescent brain is there are some other parts of the brain that are really hot on fire and the impulsivity and the risk-taking piece ramps up. And so that sometimes can overwhelm the frontal lobe in that adolescent time period. And so I'll frequently hear parents say, well, he used to be able to remember to get socks and shoes, but now that we're in middle school, it's like his brain is dead. Like, (laughs) oh, that's just puberty. Like, but but it's probably not going away real soon. And so let's talk about how to help him be who he wants to be, which is a competent, independent, growing young man. So interesting. So we have a, um, um, what is it called? A, a chart, not a chart, but we have little um, things that we put up when our kids were younger. So there was a toaster to remind them to eat. There was a toilet to remind them to go pee pee and all of those things and so they had a little envelope and they would pull them down every time they did a thing because I get t- got tired of going through the list of everything they needed to do did you do this did you do this did you brush your teeth all those things so we're gonna have to put that back up basically when <laughs> when they all become teenagers or a some form of it well and you might be able to use like texting or some kind of app to mm-hmm. say let me know when these things are done because you know this as well as I do. Emotional regulation often goes along with frontal lobe functioning, right? And our kids with ADHD, not all of them, but some of them can have trouble with emotional regulation. I, as a mom, don't want to spend all morning or all afternoon or all evening arguing with my children, right? Mm -hmm. So in some ways, I'm a very lazy parent. There's the list, the list is on the fridge, you go do the list. When you're done with the list, you let me know and I'll come and look. But if you come and get me and the list isn't done, then you're not getting the Wi-Fi password or you're not getting the device or you're not getting driven to the ice cream store. Because my thought is, I don't wanna be policing you. I don't wanna be reminding you. First of all, it's annoying to you and it's annoying to me even more so. And second of all, it creates, and this is what we see in some of the older students we see, this dependence on the parent will be my executive functioning. Mm. I want the student to learn ways that work for them. Is it that you write it down? I have students who use a dry erase marker on their mirror in their bathroom, and they might make things like, you know, remember to take your calculator to school, or they might have a goal of doing math homework every day. You know how it's easy to skip math homework and I'll have them write on their dry, you know, with their dry erase marker on their mirror, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and put little boxes. And then they get to check the box on the bathroom mirror when it's done. And, and so I don't know, maybe, maybe there are parents out there who just love the sound of their voice going, pick up the damn shoes. 
pick up the damn shoes. Well, mine now are both at an age where what I hear back is, I know. I'm like, well, if you, and then, you know, then I say the very essence of the anti ADHD thing. Well, if you knew, you would do it. <laughs> I'm so glad you're a normal parent. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, I, I want to, I want to, um, could, could you elaborate on for some parents who may not know what, what hyper focus is? Oh, sure. Sure. Right. So we go back to this idea of ADHD is really a fundamental dysregulation where someone's brain is not regulating for them. And so what happens in attention is that things that are boring, things that have low rewards, those things are hard to focus on, right? We all know that about the ADHD kid. Well, he can sure focus when it comes to video games. She sure can, you know, take a lot of pictures for Instagram. And I don't want to be over gender realization. Um, but um, so the ADHD brain tends to be a little bit all on or all off. And so this hyper focus that we see is when people with ADHD get locked into something that they love or something that's incredibly rewarding. And video games, of course, are designed to be incredibly rewarding. So that's why we tend to see hyper-focus with them. With some kids, we might also see hyper-focus on Legos. We might see hyper-focus on Instagram. We might see hyper-focus on sporting statistics. But hyper-focus is basically a state of mind where the brain is so locked into what they're doing that that is all they focus on and they have a hard time pulling themselves away from that. And so in some ways it can be a gift because sometimes it leads people with ADHD to find something that they love that maybe they want to earn a living doing. Um, but on the younger years, it can be hard because if you have a child who's hyper-focused on something and they really need to shift their attention, that can be difficult. I know with my own daughter, she is super into writing. And if she is writing a story or something for school, it can take her three or four hours. And I'll say to her, my sweet child, like you have got to turn your attention to the next thing we have to get done, right? I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet. I'm like, we, you, you, you know, and then I say the thing that we all say as parents, you kind of have to be done. Right. And, and then if I'm well rested and I've had a good dinner and, you know, not had too much coffee, I'll say, how can I help you to be done? Right. Or what will it take for you to decide that getting math done is as equally important as language arts, but hyper-focus I do think is one of those things that can be thought of as a gift and in some ways it very much can be um, but it is not unilaterally a gift so uh, to that point you know oh wait I, you're not going to bring me into some marriage discussion now are you oh, no, no, I, no 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 <laughs> no I, I could but no i won't i won't okay. <laughs> now i don't like no what do you think about that but no i'm not gonna do that <laughs> um so with hyper focus it like the things that I'm good at, I'm really, really, really good at. Yeah. But the things that I don't like, yeah. and, and and this is the thing is is not that it's not that we can't do those things. It's that we don't like to do them. It's, they're boring. It's it, it's like ugh, like when I think of something that I really just don't want to do, right. even if I know I have to do it, my brain it just goes ugh, and <laughs> like literally it, it does, and so. <laughs> Then with hyper focus, you know, and you know, you can elaborate more on this, you know, uh, but the the part of the brain where dopamine comes from, and the dopamine that's that, that's the pleasure chemical release. So that's where the happiness and noise comes from come, comes from is from doing something you love and you're passionate about. Your brain, it gives us it's like a sense of euphoria. Like I can deep dive into research, I can do math problems like it's nobody's business. But ask me to do a lesson plan, you know. Um, and for all of us, it's all different. And I think the the challenge is how do you motivate your child? And because, and you know, honestly, we all have in our own ways. It's just, it's just, we just kind of regularly better. But how do we 
help to regulate those areas where we don't like to do it, but it still has to get done. You know, that that's the challenge. You know, it's there are things that I love to do that I want to do and need to do and some things I want to do and don't need to do. Now that's a challenge there, but also the things that I don't want to do, but need to do as well. And so one of the things that, you know, I have put in as, as a strategy, I call it the power of 15 minutes mm-hmm. is I tell my kids, you can do anything for 15 minutes. Love it. Anything. E- even if you hate it, if you set a timer for 15 minutes and say, go. And then after 15 minutes, give, what I've learned is to give your child, like have encourage, hey, if you get this thing that you don't want to do, I'm going to give you, and basically what you're saying is you're going to give them a dopamine hit. You're going to give them a reward. Like today I was working on some stuff like spreadsheets. My wife loves Excel. And so like she can do spreadsheets like nobody's business. I hate them. But you know what? I, I mean, she loves them. I hate them. I did it for about 15, 20 minutes. And then I played a round of war robots. And you know what? It was awesome. Because I knew when I was done typing on my spreadsheet, I had war robots on the other end of it. And that's what got me through it. So, you know, so anyway, can you elaborate just about that a little bit more? Yeah. Well, the first thing I want to say about that is I think it's so important for us as adults to have genuine empathy in that situation, right? Like, Donita, you and I, I mean, we might, we don't know each other, but I'm hypothesizing that when you have something to do, your brain probably works a little bit like mine, like, oh, I have this to do. And then the memory part of your brain kind of wakes up and is like, oh, the last time I had something to do, I got it done and it was good. And, you know, the emotion part of your brain kicks in and is like, oh, I'm going to help this person or I feel really excited about this project. And so naturally all the pathways in our brain start to click together. And before we know it, we're putting our glasses on, you know, we're grabbing our pen, we're on the computer, you know, we've, we've got it going on, right, girl? Yeah. Yep. Now, our ADHD kids, on the other hand, that doesn't happen naturally. That doesn't happen organically for them all the time. The feeling of, I can't do this, is so real. And so one of the things that we do in coaching that I think is so incredibly valuable is we validate that you know your brain right now that feels so super hard to get started on that you know your brain right now your brain is not helping you get started and i'm so pleased that you can feel that and that you understand that and you can articulate that because if you can identify when you're feeling like that then we can figure out what strategies will work for you, which is a little bit the opposite sometimes of what adults want to do, which is to say, well, you just have to get it done. Or, well, everyone has to do math. Or, sorry about the annotations, but you're in an IB program, so get them done. Or, well, when you're done, then you can go X, Y, Z. So I think the empathy piece, the understanding piece, so that we are mirroring to that student, yes, you are right. You are correctly perceiving the message that your brain is sending you. And I think that's one of the ways we get away from kids with ADHD ending up with low self-esteem because we're affirming, yes, that is how you feel. And then we go on to the part where we talk about, okay, so what strategy is going to work for you? Is it the I'm going to line up 15 mini M&Ms and I'm going to have five to get started and I can have 10 when I'm done. Is it the, I can do anything for 15 minutes? Is it the, I'm going to imagine handing this in and how I'm going to feel and I'm going to really walk that scenario through in my mind and visualize that and get started? Is it that I'm going to break it down and say, you have to do two problems and then you can walk around the Starbucks. And then you need to do three problems and you can walk around the Starbucks and gradually building up four, five, six problems, right? So I think it's empathy and then it's strategies. And to me, the beauty of coaching is we're looking for the strategy that works for that student, right? I mean, we can all go online and say strategies for task initiation. 
How do I start doing things I don't want to do? And, and you can come up with a hundred of them in the blink of an eye, right? But especially for a student and the younger they are, the harder it is to say, oh yeah, that one is going to work for me. What I need is I need a snack and a cup of water and I need to know that I can do my art after this. Or yes, I know what I need is to close my door and sit on my floor cross-legged and open the computer up and say, you only have to do this for 10 minutes. And that is one of the fundamental pieces of what we do in coaching is, okay, this week, let's try this strategy for task initiation or that strategy for time management. And it's figuring out how does this child best work their brain, right? Because I'll tell you, my husband and I have two totally different strategies for task initiation. My husband says, you got to put your shoulder to the wheel. I'm like, um, no, like, I don't really want to put my shoulder to any wheel. That sounds really unappealing. I'm going to go back to bed. Um, and he's like, you got to put your shoulder to the wheel. I'm like, no, uh, no. Me, right? I'm all like, oh, it's going to look so nice when we're done reorganizing the garage. Oh, I'm going to be able to find things. I'm going to be able to go to Target and buy more stuff that I don't need, right? <laughs> Two totally different strategies. And that's the thing about our kids, right? They need help figuring out what's going to work for them. I have had kids who, you know, football, okay, you can check the score of the game on Monday night after you get, you know, this much of your Quizlet perfected. So it's about chunking, it's about strategy, and it's about then the self-reflection. Did that work? Did it help you get started, right? Did it make it easier? Because that's ultimately what we want, right? We want our children and our teenagers and our students and our sons and daughters with ADHD to be able to make their ADHD brain do what they're capable of doing. You know, one of the things that you said when we were on the phone a couple of weeks ago is that you as an advocate and a coach as you help kids learn to advocate for themselves, because, you know, let's be real, they're not going to be with us all the time. And when they're at school for seven hours a day or whatever, I can't be there to say, hey, teacher, this is what DJ needs or whatever. So what are the, some of the things that you do to help the kids advocate for themselves? And I know that it's going to differ by age too, because, you know, the younger kids, it's going to be more difficult. So can you talk to that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. I think this is one of the trickiest situations, right? I've seen so many 504s written to say, you know, Tabitha will, upon request, be able to walk around the classroom or, you know, if Meredith says she needs extra time, she can receive extra time. And, you know, I'm not sure that that's the way we should be doing it, given that we know that there tend to be developmental delays. Um, and so, you know, I think this is something that we as parents and the school system and as educators really need to think about is how do we provide these accommodations because we know it's the right thing to do but then also, how do we meet our kids where they're at when it comes to asking for what they need? Um, and you know, as I do, that you've got some kids who'll ask for the moon and settle for a star and they'll, they'll be thrilled with that. And then you've got some kids who will never speak up. I hear all the time, I don't want to be that kid with extra time. I don't want to have to ask the teacher. I don't want to have a different seat in the classroom. So I know for us, the way our team approaches it is we try to build those advocacy skills in a really safe environment. And so we'll teach them by putting them in a position of power in coaching, right? Okay, so do you want to start with this task or this task today? What would you prefer? What makes the most sense for your brain? Okay. Will you let me know when you need a break and need to go to the bathroom, get a drink, whatever it is? Let me know. You have two bricks in our hour session. So we teach them very explicitly 
how to use the words and how to recognize the signs of what they need. And then we do, of course, a lot of praise. Like, I'm so glad you asked me for a break. I didn't realize you needed a break then, right? And, and then we practice doing the same thing at home. Like, let's figure out how to tell your parents that, you know, sitting down for dinner at seven when you've just gotten home from sports practice and you really want to take advantage of that energy to crank out, you know, your whatever it is, AP US history, you know, talk to them, say, hey, can we come up with some solution so I can have 30 minutes after I get home from sports to knock out this homework before I eat and then I'm exhausted and want to go to bed. And so we'll practice then generalizing that to the family situation. And then we start to practice to what do you need to ask your teachers for? And, um, you know, I'll tell you, we work with kids who are kind and they're respectful and they're good kids. And that's how most kids are. And they don't want to trouble their teachers or bother their teachers or ask for special things. And so um, I think it's really important that that start either in coaching or at home to say, let me teach you how to ask for what you want and what you want and what you need is appropriate and that's okay. I certainly grew up as a person not getting that message and I wasn't particularly atypical. I mean, I was a bright kid and I was a little quirky, but um, I didn't need accommodations at school, but I never got the message it was okay to ask for what you need. And so I think we have to help our kids practice that skill, not just tell them what to do. I know with students that I coach through my education coaching company, um, I say a couple of things on how to how to approach their work is one, um, like if you if you were to rank from what you hate the most to what you love the most, what would it be? And they say, I hate this, 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 and I really love this, this, and this. I say, great. I said, would you rather end the night with what you hate or end the night with what you love? And I say, end the night with what you love. I say, well, then how will we, how do we get there? So well, let's, let's attack the stuff you really don't want to do because it's not going away. So let's attack what you hate first. And that's really how I'm, how I'm approaching my life now. It's all the stuff I hate to do, get it done first so I can spend more time doing what I really love to do. Because the more I get that stuff out of the way, the more I can spend time on my hyper-focused stuff that, you know, I really want to do more of. So let me suck. So let me suck it up and right. get it on the front end. And also another way of another approach is uh, what subjects are the hardest for you and which ones were the easiest for you? We draw the end of the night on something that's easy or end of the night to something that's hard. They say, I'd rather end the night on something that's easy. Okay, great. So let's go back. What's your hardest subject? Let's attack that first. And let's, and let's, have decreasing level of rigor and difficulty as you go through the night and for every child that's different because for every subject some kids might love reading and writing some might love mathematics and science uh, but whatever it is for that child start with what they hate start with what um um is time consuming and then kind of work it from there as well well and that's fascinating right what i find a lot is students like to do one or two things to get their brain started. Like, I wanna cross this off. Or I wanna get this five minute thing done. Or I wanna turn in this assignment. Kind of wakes the brain up, gets them going. And then often my students will say what you say. Now I wanna do the hard stuff, right? And then I can leave the easy stuff to the end. But it's so individual, you know? All and right. that's, I think, part of the advocacy, right? Is knowing what works for you and asking to do it that way you know, I feel like I need to say within the confines of the system, but not necessarily, you know, I mean, systems can be changed. Another thing you and I discussed earlier was, um, I'll go back a little bit, as I think treatment of mental illness and mental, um, I, I don't, for lack of a better word, abnormalities, different brains, um, is so new for um for us not just us as the baileys but parents in general um and so we tend to choose one thing that's going to fix it you know so it's medication that's going to fix it or we're going to get a 504 plan in place and that's going to fix it but you talked about the importance of a comprehensive treatment team so what does that look like who's that going to involve 
Oh, I'm so glad you brought this up because this is, I think, this is just part of our journey as parents, right? You learn that your child has a particular challenge, right? Um, and what do you want? You want to fix it. It's the same as when they were little. They had a dirty diaper. They were hungry. They were bored. You wanted to fix it. It comes from a place of love, right? It comes from a place of nurturing and kindness. And so we do as parents on our journey of acceptance, not really of our child, but of the reality of what this entails. I think we go through this very natural stage of wanting to fix it. You know, and I've heard the same thing that you've heard. Well, if the school would just put a 504 in place, or if the teacher just understood how to teach him, or, you know, once we get the medicine, and all of those things come from our parental love, right? We want it to be better for our kids. But I think we would be so much better off if the professionals who are doing the diagnosis talk about, you know, ADHD is a chronic condition. That's what the white paper by the American Academy of Pediatrics says. It's a chronic condition and it requires chronic care, just as diabetes does, just as epilepsy does, just as vision problems do. And it could be a mild level of care or it could be a more intense level of care depending on how complex your ADHD or is, right? But you do as a parent, need a team, right? And the team is the medical professional, the team is your people at school. And the people at school include not just the teachers, right? But it could include your ESE teacher, it could include whoever is in charge of compliance for 504s and IEPs, it could include a favorite teacher of your student who really gets them and advocates for them, right? And helps the other teachers understand them. I'll never forget, I had this student, Emily, and when she was in middle school, she had this teacher who loved her, who saw all the good things in her, despite the fact that she was mouthy and impulsive and you know, sometimes said and did things that got her in trouble, but he saw her real self, right? And he went around and he talked to the teachers and he was like, Emily is such a good person. She is a good person. She is a bright student. She has got this amazing future. And so when I talk about a team, I'm really talking about those people who can advocate for your child. Some of us need educational advocates to help make sure the 504 or the IEP is in place. And honestly, I'll tell you, part of um, what I think is really helpful is having an academic or ADHD coach. Because what ADHD and academic coaching does is different from what tutoring or therapy or medication can do. And so you and I have talked, not that many people know what ADHD coaching does or what it can do for your student. But I would say that if you can find an ADHD coach to put on your student's team and they need that, that should be part of the team for sure. Sometimes you might need a therapist, um, but all of those people need to be playing a role in their area of specialization. And then as a parent, we kind of become the case manager and that's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of work. That's kind of hard there, babe. Hmm? You, laughed a little, you laughed a little too hard. You know, we have somebody else in the house that has ADHD. Well, yeah, yeah, we just fine. finished virtual learning and all of that stuff. That was really challenging for sure. Yeah, you, you know, to, to the point, you know, that every child is different. Every child needs different help. What I noticed is that I had some kids who, prior to, to the pandemic, you know, they were, you know, very, really hyper and energetic. They got home and they were killing it. They were crushing it because what I saw was that some of the, because in class you have, I think in the classroom, like a stage. Right. And, you know, and they have the other actors in the room and the audience. Mm. to feed off of but for some kids when the audience went away they got in the zone <laughs> and i saw kids who i mean it was like a 180 um i hate when people say it's a 360 that means you're right back where you are <laughs> this is just the math of me coming out don't say parents don't say it did a 360 no that means you're right back where you started anyway <laughs> but um i just saw well, to your point i think 
being at home for some kids, you change that environment. And that is one of the things we know is so powerful. You take away those distractions, whether they're the auditory distractions, whether they're the social distractions, when that child can focus, right? right. You've done a huge accommodation, if you will, because that student is really doing well. The other piece of what you're saying is that for our students who not only have ADHD, but are on the autism spectrum, the sensory overload of school and the classroom and the demands of all of that can be overwhelming. And so sometimes those students did very well at home because they had so much less sensory input that their brains weren't overwhelmed and they were able to focus and do their work. And so that has been fascinating to me to watch which kids did thrive and sure they were the minority, but there were kids who were thriving with at home learning. And it's been interesting to watch how does the education system and how do education entrepreneurs um, capitalize on that to create more opportunities for our kids. Mm -hmm. Right. I think that it's a very, if you don't have an ADHD brain like you do, and for, fortunately for your students, you do, and you get it, but there's a lot of teachers that don't get it. And um, they end up being the troubled, the, the bothersome troubled kid that gets written up or clicked down if they're in the younger grades. How would you recommend that teachers are trained differently to assist students with ADHD? You know what I would love to see is additional training on the neurology of learning and on developmental neurology because educators get a lot of training on behavior and classroom management, right? That's yep. all based on, you know, principles of reward and punishment. That doesn't work with a lot of students. And it's not just that it doesn't work with ADHD students. It doesn't work with kids who are defiant. It doesn't work with kids who are anxious or depressed, right? And so I would love, I mean, if I had, you know, three wishes for education training, I really would love to revamp this whole notion of classroom management as behavior management and replace it with classroom culture building and relationship building and trust building and much deeper knowledge of the neurology of what are your students like you know what what is the kid with anxiety struggling with what is the kid with anxiety and ADHD struggling with and how do you approach that and quite honestly i don't think that that is as hard as it might sound there are certain things that are very common that have become almost epidemic in our COVID epidemic. And if we learned strategies for connecting with students who have ADHD, autism, anxiety, depression, you know, a teacher could go to a half day workshop and learn the neurology of those, as well as ways to connect and create a safe environment. And I think transform education. Mm. You know, in all the years that I've been in teaching, I've never had had comprehensive training on ADHD, ADD. You know, we talk about 504s and how to make sure they're in fours. But to your point, um, understanding all of the nuances that, that come about, and those really come through relationships. And if you're getting to know your kids, you know, as I you know, as I get to hear the stories of my kids, and I've heard some heartbreaking stories, it just gave me a whole new like things like, oh, whack them. Like, oh, you know their brother just got shot and killed or um i've had kids who have just they just they've gone through stuff you know what i mean and we expect them just to come in and just put on put on the, the right the right mask and face and just do things knowing not knowing that there's a story behind every single child and we don't know until we get to know them what it is and it's only done through relationship building um you know, the management part is important because you, you have to get through things. But at the same time, when you build that trust and when you build those relationships, um, that's important. And I would also say that at home for parents as well is as you focus more on getting to understand your child and how they operate and understand, you know, 
what makes them tick, um, it becomes less of a management thing, but a support thing. Hmm. 100%, right? Once you stop expecting the ADHD to go away and you start saying, how can I support, right? How do I normalize this? How do I stop saying, when are you going to learn to pick up your trash and say, well, you know, at some point he will learn to pick up his trash and focus on your relationship. I think it, I think it transforms a family, you know, I'll never remember there was um, a family that I was working with a few years ago and they said, we've been coming to coaching for six months and he still hates doing his homework. And I was like, yeah, he hates doing his homework because he has years of being behind in math. He doesn't understand math. He feels anxious when he's doing math. Math builds on itself. And so all of those pieces of the puzzle are still there. And, you know, this particular student um, at that time when we were working with it, he was coming to see me. Um, after his medicine had worn off. And I said, so here we have this student who has a history of not doing well in math. Math absolutely requires sustained attention. You can't easily walk around and do a math problem, right? You can't turn it on in your ears like you could with a book. And so we have to understand that that is what makes sense. So how do we build a support system, how do we scaffold this child so he can be successful in math? Do we move math homework to right when he gets home from school? Do we do math homework in the morning, right? Like, how do we help this child learn how to manage their life the same way we help kids with food allergies, right? We don't say they're still allergic to peanut butter. <laughs> you know, one thing I, I'm learning as a mom and as a wife is that we do something, maybe this is just a, a female thing, I don't know, but we take, we paint this picture of what the fam, our family is supposed to be. We frame it and we put it on the wall and then we keep looking at it and looking at our family, looking at the picture, looking at our family and they're not the same. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I'm learning to do is take the picture down, snapshot what you have, put that on the wall and start to cherish what you have currently because it could stay that way forever. <laughs> and so what really needs to change probably is you, you know, and your ability to be more loving and more understanding of, of, of the people that you have in your life and all the eccentricities and, and, challenges and all of those things um so that that's just something i'm learning to do that might be a tip <laughs> no i think you're absolutely right and it's so hard right i went into parenting thinking you know we're going to enjoy these people right we're going to have these family you know experiences and um it's going to be so great i mean not great all the time i was reasonable right but i didn't think that our family would be marked with ADHD and autism and anxiety and giftedness and that every single thing would be outside of what I, even on a subconscious level, I think hoped and dreamed for, right? And so learning the what is, is what you have and how do you appreciate that? I don't know, Let, let's get together and, and start some kind of, you know, regular conversation about that because there is this simultaneous process of, I cherish this child I have, right? I cherish them. They are so amazing. They are the most extraordinary child I could have ever wished for. And, and. they make me crazy, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so coming to terms with that of the awesomeness of how great they are and the deepness of the gratitude for what a special unique child you have, as well as some of the grief of, I wish it was a little easier for us to stand in line at Bush Gardens and wait for the roller coaster, 
you know mm -hmm. um i wish it was a little easier for my kid to write his math homework i wish it was a little easier for my kid to make sense of the world i wish it was a little easier for my kid to self-regulate their emotions but also i don't know maybe the two of you feel like this i feel like i love them so deeply because of who they are and i'm not sure that i would have had that parenting experience i mean i'm just saying this for me from my perspective i think our challenges have taught me so much more about love than if i'd had the family that i had the picture mm -hmm. of that hangs on my wall uh, i still want that family don't get me wrong <laughs> i want that family, and i want it on mother's day and father's day and christmas okay <laughs> but i have learned so much about love from my atypical kids mm. That is just the perfect way to end the show. I, I want to say one more thing. Of, of <laughs> Except for his of course, you know. <laughs> Unless you have ADHD, in which case you're going to get in one more comment. And we're <laughs> going to right. know that it is really valuable. And we are 100% wanting to hear it. <laughs> and it's important. So please tell us. And then, and then we'll wrap the show up. That's <laughs> right. That's right. That's right. So, um, you know, what, you know, many people know that, that Medanita and I, we're, we're, we, we are Christians, we're people of faith. And I think of a story, everyone, most people know the story of Moses, whether, you know, from Sunday school or, you know, just experiences. And um, when he was um, at the burning bush and uh, God said to go back to, to Egypt to deliver the people, Moses gave all these excuses as to why he couldn't go. What if they don't listen to me? What if they don't this? But then he also said, he said, but also I have stammering speech. Now, I'm, I'm, let me just, he said, basically, I, I have a speech impediment. And because I have a speech impediment, how am I going to be a mouthpiece and speak to the people when I stutter? And what the Bible said, he, God said, I will be your mouthpiece. So what was interesting was when he went back to Egypt, the very thing that was his biggest hindrance was his greatest strength that was used to help deliver the people of Israel. And we never see, I ask people this, and this is this revelation I've come across lately, which has kind of helped me to encourage, encourage some parents, whether, whether you are you know, a Christian or not, just hear me out is I ask people, do we ever see that Moses was delivered from his speech impediment? He was not. And yet he was constantly using his greatest weakness to speak. He was constantly speaking before the people with his, with his weakness. So his weakness became his strength. And what I'm, what I'm realizing is what, I mean, for a long time, I was really down on myself about, man, how come I just can't get it together? How come I just can't get it right? How come I just can't? But I'm realizing that what I'm learning is, is helping me become a better husband, a better father, a better educator. But also this is, uh, is going to be used to help bring other people out. That I'm using, everything I'm learning is going to be used to help other people because I see it all the time. And, and when I talk with parents, now, I used to be embarrassed about it. I used to be, no, I have ADD, you know, or I wouldn't say it at all. But like, no, I'm like, I, everyone who knows me knows. If you've been around me for half a second, you know, I got ADD. And I was like, you know, this is because of my ADD, right? But I use that. I'm realizing it, it, it's my superpower now. And I'm, and I'm getting so much better and stronger. Um, it hasn't gone away, but I'm learning how to better manage it, how to attack it, and then use it to reach other people to help them to come out as well. So just, just as an encouragement for, for parents and parents and families and educators. Right. Oh, you are so exactly right. Right. And you claimed that and you got to know yourself and accepted yourself. It didn't make the hard parts of the ADD go away. Mm -mm. Right. Those things are still there, but the more, you know, and the more you can work with your brain, the more, it does become something that can connect you with other people that makes our human relationships richer and deeper. You know, I'll say for my husband who does also have um, the ADHD and who's 
life in many ways um, as a child was made horrible because of it. Um, and, you know, parents who didn't necessarily understand and teachers who were driven crazy by his incessant talking. But I'll tell you, that man is the most amazing husband. He's 12 years older than I am. We have two atypical children, one with moderate autism. And do you know what his saving grace is as a parent? His hyperactivity. That man has the energy of a 20 something. Uh -huh. I'll go to bed and I'll be like, dude, I'm wiped out. You know, I am wiped out. And he's like, honey, what can I bring you? I'm going to go put the kids to bed. Then I'm going to load the dishwasher. Then I'm going to watch my show and have a sip of bourbon. And then I'll be up in the morning, <laughs> same thing. And there are so many stories like that of people who find their groove, they figure out how to make it work for them. So I love, love, love hearing your story. It doesn't go away. It doesn't necessarily have to go away, but you have to learn how to know yourself and how to use it for connection and for the betterment of you as a human being and for the betterment of other human beings around you. It is definitely something that can be harnessed for good like you're doing. Oh, thank you. And that's a great way to end. Yeah. Okay. See, see, that's the reason why I have to say this. Yeah. Unless um, David has something else to say. Right. I mean, I could go on. He could. I he could. could both I of y'all. I am going to respectfully just yeah. say we're gonna. Yeah. I'm ask her if she has any resources for parents that we should um, let them know about. Well, um, I will say I love David and I were talking earlier about the smart but scattered books. I think those are great. Um, I think that there are um, lots and lots of things out there about building executive functioning skills. And I would encourage parents to look um, at any of those resources, whether they're videos um, or books or workshops. And of course, um, on our website, we do have a blog where we offer hints and suggestions about executive functioning and social and emotional skills because those two things often go hand in hand. And so if people are interested in hearing how we frame this and what we would suggest, our blog is at russellcoaching.com. Um, Perfect. And you do virtual coaching, correct? We do coaching across the United States, in Canada, and in the UK. So yes, we moved to a virtual model a couple of years ago. We've been terribly successful at it. Um, we are a um, pretty good sized organization at this point with lots of academic and ADHD coaches. We work primarily with neurologically atypical kids and most of the kids that we work with have um, ADHD plus. So they have ADHD and anxiety or ADHD and autism. Um, or ADHD and they're gifted. Um, so um, we do occasionally have the kind of somewhat easy um, ADHD case, but primarily we do practice, we do specialize in kids who are atypical and helping them understand their brains. And so um, I think that what I love about coaching is that we're able to provide hands-on help to students who want to do better and they just can't quite figure out how to do better. And so, yeah, you can absolutely learn much more about our practice at russellcoaching.com. All right. And we will have um, everything that you mentioned, as well as your website on our website so that people can reach that. But we are out of time. Thank you so much for joining us. This has been very helpful. It has been an absolute pleasure. I'm so thrilled we connected. I think your show is wonderful. And I really would like for you to connect me with that five, uh, fifth grade boy, because his care and dedication to doing such a great job was so moving. And your story is exciting. And I love what you're doing. And I really appreciate you taking the time to have me on the show. So thank you. Well, you're welcome. And I will for sure connect you with Wyatt. Okay. So with Noggin Educational Foundation,